I am Parana Fayas. Today I'm going to introduce you to my first collection, which is called 40 Names. This collection focuses on stories and experiences from my childhood. Storytelling has a long tradition in Afghan culture. Stories are usually passed down orally. Every woman, even and especially those who are illiterate, knows and has memorized a few important stories. Stories are shared in order to enhance the listener's wisdom and to teach one to take life for its hardships as well as for its good times. I grew up among women who told stories, stories concerning women. As the time passed, the women themselves became the stories. The majority of these women never went to school, like my grandmothers, like my mother, like my aunts and cousins. These women became mothers to their little girls. As the time passed, their little girls became wives and mothers. They share their philosophy of life down through generations of women. In the face of hardship, sabar dabosh, meaning be patient. In the face of hardship, sabar dawa as dawa, meaning patience is the remedy. When I left my home and Afghanistan to embark on my journey to become more educated, I began to reflect on the lives of the women I had always admired and the stories I had been told or because of observing how they lived their lives. I began to question my admiration for them. They were suffering and yet they accepted it. And moreover, they taught their daughters and the women who came after them to do the same. To suffer in silence is seen a token of patience. They passionately believed, sabar bari shirindara, meaning patience brings sweet fruit. Gradually, I became more critical of their lessons advocating patience. With more education, patience became more and more elusive. In a state, I found the courage and the space to pick up a pen and write poems that say the unsaid and name the unnamed. In the process of writing these poems, poetry became more than just stories. Going back and forth between poetic images in Persian and ideas formulated, developed and written in English, I eagerly practiced the art of translation at the level of emotion and imagination. A poet like myself thinks in one language and measures and understands experiences in a different language. Learning a different language, in this case English, offered me the opportunity to write freely and discover my voice. Over time, my journey in pursuit of education that led me from Afghanistan to South Asia, to the, to the United States, and most recently to the UK, resulted in interactions with individuals from many cultures and intellectuals, intellectual traditions. And this, in turn, informed my voice and helped me develop my poetic style. I gained a testing lens which enabled me to rediscover the tradition I was brought up in, the stories I had heard, the women I had observed. Now I admire them for different reasons. I no longer want to absorb the lessons of their lives with the goal of emulating them. Instead, I want to honor them and their experiences by retelling their stories, using my poetic voice. That said, the poems in this collection are collection are also memories. One of the challenges in writing these poems has been the crucial act of understanding my own feelings about these memories and the stories I share, especially the ones that involve familial narratives. In the process of writing each poem, I question myself, I doubted myself, and yet I became certain when the poem was finished the ending to each of these poems is a reconciliation with the self that I have become through questioning, 
searching, reflection, and development. That all-encompassing self is the storyteller and the voice in these poems and also the person I am today. I would like to finish this video presentation by reading one of my poems in the collection, which is called The Silent Poet. The Silent Poet I remember an ever-recent young woman. Every time I visited, she would fill the pockets of my coat with dried apricots, mulberries and almonds. The most educated girl in her family, she had passed her sixth grade education and grown up on Kabul University Road. She loved poetry. She wore the miniskirts and socks of the time. The youngest of her five siblings, she was also the bravest. She spoke against her father's second marriage. Her faith was sealed when my grandfather Grass fled Kabul with his two wives, Line and Good Fortune, four sons and seven daughters, and returned to the family's village in Ghazni. My mother's sister, Sadiqa, was the only unmarried child from the first wife and the oldest remaining daughter. I remember her subdued face and her white wedding dress, her dark brown hair in the shape of a crown, the mirror image of my mother. Grandfather Grass hatched a master plan. He would arrange a, a marriage for his daughter and then send Grandmother Line to Iran to her sons. His plan was successful. Once in the village, where life was lived between the feet of cows and the men wearing rifles on their shoulders, Siddiqa was forcibly married off to a man who knew only of cows and goats. And her marriage to this man was a punishment. My mother says the same words every time he insults her in public. I remember at the time of her marriage, Siddiqa couldn't say a word. People saw it as her defeat and danced with their scarves running across their faces. In this time and in the years that came after, she was silent but not deaf. The music of the mud river, the singing of moth butterflies and the memory of Grandmother Lyne's tears gave life to her poetry. In the stalls, in herding, she quietly wrote of her and her mother's hardship. She remained quiet for years. Then she returned to Kabul. She was reunited with Grandmother Line after 15 years. She read her poems. Grandmother Line, despite her faded memory, cried tears like the waterfall. I did not understand why Grandmother Ryan was crying, but she must have been thinking of the poet her daughter had been in her childhood. But what use is the memory that cannot speak? I remember I met Sadika again too. Once again she filled my pockets with dry fruits, but this time she also put in a letter for me to read to my mother. Her letter was a poem that whispered of her invisible wounds and the healing that came to her from seeing my mother. She had been quiet all this time, for they had advised her, put a rock in between your teeth and don't let it fall, otherwise you will be punished. Writing poetry, no one could punish her. The rock did not fall. Her illiterate husband did not mind the papers. He was not aware that he was the fuel for the fire raging within her. Now, Siddiqa writes her poems like WhatsApp messages and shares them with her siblings. Her poetry makes sense of the past, as if she can heal herself and others only with words. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed reading all the other poems in the collection. I hope to see you all in person soon.
Take care. Bye. <laughs>